Thank you very much, and thank you, Barnes & Nobles, for hosting this event. And thank you all for coming. He pulled me by my hair, and he dragged me up 36 metal steps. Each one I could feel as my cheek went against them, making a mark in my face. I had to spend weeks in the hospital, and I will never look the same again. This story was not the worst I heard, far from the worst, in fact, while I was researching this book. But when I told a colleague about it, he said, sexism? Are you kidding? There's no more sexism in America. That's so passe. And actually, that's pretty much the kind of attitude I ran into when I first began to do the study. <coughs> Alive and well, my dentist asks, after Hillary almost got the Democratic nomination and Sarah Palin had the number two spot on the Republican ticket, how can you say sexism is alive and well? Hmm. I wonder if he'd say Barack Obama's presidency has obliterated racial discrimination in America. But before I can ask, he says, besides, with so much wrong in this country, why are you worrying about women? He lifts a dental mirror and curette from the tray. Since I have a policy never to argue with someone about to put a sharp instrument in my mouth, I don't respond as I want to. But my dentist, thoughtful and progressive though he is, has just proven my point. Women are part of this country, 51% of it. And the problems facing us as a nation fall mightily upon them. Now certainly, we're far from the dark ages before the second wave of the women's movement. Back then, the moment you were zipped into your pink blanket sleeper, your future was pretty much dictated. You didn't get to play with your brother's erector set or blocks. You got to play with dolls. When you went on to high school, you weren't allowed to take electronics, mechanics, automotive shop. You got to take cooking, and in my case, sewing. <laughs> now, the object, I see many nodding faces here. Now, the object of our sewing class was to make a jumper that we actually had to wear the last day of school. And we were all really excited about this, except if you were like me. I grew three and a half inches my seventh grade year. Therefore, by the time June rolled around, my jumper was so short on me, I was not allowed to wear it into the classroom. When you graduated from high school, if there wasn't enough money in the family for both boys and girls to go on to college, most likely you would have to stay home while your brother went on to college. And that was considered OK, because after all, your only goal in life was to get married and have children. But let's say that didn't happen immediately, and you had to work. And you were perhaps good in math, against all odds. And the reason I say against all odds was because back then, the mantra was girls couldn't do math in the same way that girls couldn't be good athletes, couldn't be good friends, couldn't drive cars. But suppose you were, it had somebody who really, you were someone who really, really had studied math. Well, you could only find a job under the female only part of the want ad section. There were female jobs and they were male jobs. So you might be able to find a job as a bookkeeper, but you would never be able to find a job as a financial manager, as an auditor, as a treasurer. It was a time when if you were single, you were refused a credit card in your own name. You would be refused a mortgage in your own name. You could even be refused service in a restaurant if you were dining alone. But you could never, never refuse to have sex with a husband. A diseased husband, an alcoholic husband, with any husband. It was a time when it was said women asked to get raped and needed a good slap. Now, since that time, our commitment and conversation 
and connection to the whole issue of sexism has waxed and waned in the American psyche. We saw how during the 2008 primary and presidential election, it became a hot topic, only to disappear again. And actually, what we saw during that period of time was only a small, small outcropping from the solid bedrock of misogyny in this country. Now, I think it's fair to say that for the past 30 years, we have been considered to be a post-feminist society. But let me ask you something. What is post-feminist about a society where a doctor who happens to perform late-term abortions is murdered in cold blood in his church on a Sunday with his whole family present? What is post-feminist about a society where before this last election, one in four school children thought it was illegal, illegal for a woman to be president of the United States? What is post-feminist about a society where our ads and television commercials are demeaning to women, such as one for a very popular chain store that shows an adolescent girl lying on a target with the bullseye right between her legs? What is post-feminist about a society where the subprime mortgage debacle fell with particular hardship on poor women and women of color. These were women who were struggling to have a piece of the American dream. Some were single moms, some were elderly moms. And when they started out, their mortgage rates were rates that they could afford, only to see them adjusted and adjusted and adjusted upward till they had to forfeit their homes. Anita Hill, who's a law professor at Brandeis University, has just completed a study in which he found that all women, no matter what their background, were charged more than men, even men in the same differently comparable, I should say, financial situations. What is post-feminist about a society where movies, G-rated movies, the ones that we think are most appropriate for our young people, have 75% of the characters male, and overwhelmingly, even more than 75% of these characters have the speaking parts. Now, one of the, I guess I could call it mixed blessings of doing this research, is that I got to watch a lot of television and movies that I wouldn't ordinarily have seen. So one of them was the movie B Story, a very popular G-rated movie. In this movie, Barry B is the star, and he has, obviously, a very large speaking part. There are only two female characters who speak. One of them is Barry's mom, who is a kind of stereotypical, intrusive helicopter mom. And because she's a bee, she actually can hover over Barry. The other character is Vanessa Bloom. She's a human being and the florist. Now, you'd think because she's a human being and Barry's a bee, that she would be more capable, that she could navigate the human world, but not so. Vanessa's always getting into trouble, and Barry has to bail her out. Their mission, the plot of the movie, revolves around Barry and Vanessa trying to save the world from the extinction of all the flowers. And to accomplish this aim, they commandeer an airplane. Now, neither one of them has ever piloted an airplane before. So Vanessa is sitting in the pilot seat, trying to figure out how to do it, and Barry is giving her directions. And he keeps giving her directions, and she gets increasingly flustered till he slaps her on the face. And a fight ensues. What are our children learning from this, I'm sure, very, very unintended message that women are ornamental, annoying, irritating, and then when they get out of line, they need a good slap. So, post-feminist? No, not really. And maybe it's not then such a surprise that in the global gender index, 
the United States ranks 27th in the world, behind Cuba and Lithuania. Now let me just tell you a moment what this index is. It's a study of 160 countries that hold 90% of the world's population. And they compare countries on the basis of education, employment, how much representation we have in government, and health and survival. So let's just start with education. In education, Title IX has been chipped away and chipped away and chipped away, depleted of its funding, even though, even though every study has shown that when young women engage in sports, they're not likely to drink, to do drugs, to become teenage mothers, or develop eating disorders, either way, either obesity or become too thin, and they do better in school. 